40 year old nonprofit organization um, in the environmental space uh, is partnering to host this on their wonderful green campus. Um, thank you very much for hosting us here. Uh, I'm Ravneet Bawa. I'm the Deputy Vice President Global Operations uh, and CEO of South Asia for Deakin University. Uh, and I've had the experience of being in the international sector for over three decades, uh, working with uh, various countries, including the US, UK, and Australia for the last 30 years. Um, I'm also the chairperson of BCF. Thank you to Amita uh, and Matthew for being great friends and for being uh, great associates uh, and doing such good work um, and, and making us uh, proud of the work that you both do, and especially to BCF. Uh, for all the amazing work it does on the ground to make a difference. That little difference that we can make in changing lives goes a very long way as we approach the world. I'm glad to be able to share some thoughts on the very interesting topic of transmedia approach to environmental advocacy. I remember the first time I learned about the importance of saving water or conserving energy was from a textbook in school. And as a young student, it really motivated me to think about it and really think about what does this mean and how can I contribute to this? Things have changed over the years and in how we consume information with the advent of the internet and cellular services. We now have a media globally connected world and people have become reliant and resilient and on media technologies to inform, educate, and guide. Transmedia takes advantage of the rapid convergence of media and allows users, both the audience and the storytellers, to participate in rich hybrid environments that have shown to foster real emotional engagement with the process of learning. Today's audience no longer wish to read an isolated story in a newspaper or to see an ad on a billboard about climate change, people, want to come together. People want to make a difference. People want to engage. People want to interact. And people want to see how one person along with the others can make this difference. Transmedia techniques for mental advocacy leverage the power of collective intelligence and enable users to weave the narrative through media in a seamless and a wholly interactive and participative fashion to a wider audience. I look forward to our wonderful speaker today, and I'm really, really looking forward to hearing your thoughts on this. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to introduce speaker for today, Ms. Sophia Ashraf. A big round of applause. <laughs> Sophia is a digital content creator, a rapper, a writer, with over 10 years of experience. My God, you must have started very young. 10 years of experience in the fields of advertising and communication. She began rapping at the age of 18. Her first public stage was Justice Rocks, a copy left initiative that uses the medium of performing arts and music to challenge corporate globalization, discrimination, and hate politics. In 2015, Collective along with Sophia produced the coordinate Cody Canal Wound, a video addressing the mercury positioning caused by the thermometer factory owned by Unilever. The video garnered over 4, 4 million plus views and resulted in the multinational company compensating 591 of their ex employees. Fantastic initiative. Sophia Ashraf also created content on YouTube under the Sister from South on the Feminist channel, Blush, her primary media of choice are music and comedy. Brought up in an extremely orthodox Muslim household, Sophie's primary objective is to help girls like her fight years of social conditioning and moral policing to hate their true calling. She's currently a filmmaker making female forward comedy content. Fantastic, lovely to have you over and welcome. And before I go, I'm going to also introduce Dr. Ashok Kosla, a well-known, greatly respected environmentalist, teacher, and chairman of Development Alternatives, and known for pioneering the concept of sustainable development. He was the president of the IUCN, the Club of Rome, member of the World Future Council. 
He will now make his introductory remarks. Well, after uh, the meeting, what is left to say? I want to welcome you. We have a place here which has been here for about 15 years, uh, made basically out of natural materials, natural and recycled materials. We have virtually no virgin materials at all, other than um, the stone in the floors uh, and in the walls. Otherwise, uh, actually, the entire place is made out of waste materials like fly ash, like stone dust, uh, like demolition waste, basically, recycled into this building. And uh, we save something of the order of 55, 60% materials and energy so this is a kind of a concept that um, we want to exemplify that you can live well you can live an elegant life but you don't have to massacre mother nature so our organization has been around for 39 years next year will be our 40th anniversary and um, as uh, amita says the next decade will be our towards our golden jubilee. So we've been around, we're not young uh, off the block at the moment. We've been able to demonstrate that there are things we can do uh, that will make a difference. And the difference has to be made. I think most of you know, uh, not just the climate crisis, not just the extinction of species, but the massive deprivation uh, of poor uh, poverty and uh, uh, hunger in our world it's just not, no longer acceptable. And each one of us has a responsibility for all those problems. If there are poor people, they're poor because we are well off. And we've got to now make sure that we are well off and they will be well off too. So our whole approach to life is a different one. The alternatives in development alternatives is really in a sense turning the world upside down, not accepting uh, the way we have received it, but to design something that's better for the future. And that future is now. Uh, I um, want to add a few words to the question of communication. You know, um, it is all about communication. It's all about not just simply giving and taking listening to messages, it's incorporating them into our lives. And the way we do that is um, now uh, gone more or less out of our hands been taken over by TikTok and it's been take, overtaken by uh, Facebook and Instagram, none of which really is able to get into the depth of the issues that we need to deal with them. People like you, who are going to be the next generation, need to know everything in detail. Uh, I don't know how many of you uh, remember Captain Planet. Now, I suppose you're too young for Captain Planet because it's broadcast on Darshan during the 1990s. And uh, you were probably neither bo either not born or if you were, you were very young. But Captain Planet was a hero, a animated hero on television, 120 odd um, episodes of this, uh, carved out a very deep understanding and commitment around the world among younger people. They're not the Gen X, Gen Z, they are really basically the millennials. Uh, and of course, um, today millennials are in disrepute for having not taken on full responsibility for the state of affairs we live in. But basically, Captain Planet uh, brings together literally tens of millions of people around the world, uh, and hopefully their children, uh, to think different, to think about their responsibilities as much as their rights. So I hope that what uh, we're going to hear just now, and Sophie puts this so much better than I do, so I don't want to take up your time because I think we're here really to listen to her, um, and not just listen, but to incorporate, to make a part of ourselves, the message that the world no longer can take the kind of abuse that we have given it. In each of our individual lives, in our organizational lives, in our community lives and in our nation's lives. We often see uh, people up there who are supposed to know better, 
doing the wrong things. And now I think for us, it's a duty to call the shots, to say, no, that's not good enough. We now have to change the way things are. In the light of what happened in Glasgow, which is all uh, in some ways very useful, not great, but it was adequate to be able to say we had a, a kind of commitment, global commitment made there. Uh, nevertheless, it's not nowhere near what we need to be. And I hope that all of us will keep insisting over the next few years that the world has to take responsibility for its future. If we're going to have decent lives the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, then each one of us has to contribute to that. So thank you. And I want to just thank uh, Sophie for having um, chosen us to, um, to give her messages to and to um, Amita and uh, Ravneet for having um, brought you all here. Thank you. Check, check, check. Vanakam, namaste, Adab. My name is Sophia Ashraf. Uh, I'm a protest musician. What is a protest music musician? Basically, when I play music at home, my mother protests and she says enough. Uh, but uh, what I generally do is I go to uh, protest marches. I work with movements. I work with grassroots movements and also movements in the metros to build, build awareness around issues. Now I'm very used to normally morchas and stuff where there's naras. So just to make me feel at home, will you all join me in a little bit of a nara? So one of the naras I really like is Sadda Hak Ete Rak, which you know was made into a song. So I'll say Sadda Hak and you should say Ete Rak, just to make me feel at home like I'm in one of these places. Yeah? Sadda Hak! Sadda Hak! Thank you so much. Um, so what uh, I will do is I have a little bit of a presentation. Um, just before I jump into the presentation, let me tell you what transmedia is. I think the speak everyone before me has already explained it to you. Basically, just using different kinds of media, and that doesn't mean just social media, television, social media, digital media, common spaces, uh, relationships, everything to uh, use to, uh, as a form of storytelling. Um, Hold on just a moment. Yes. So that's why I call it look over here because. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, um, before I jump into the presentation, I thought I will take you a little on a little journey of how I got into this. Uh, back when I was in college, um, I used to be in a hijab and uh, out of choice. And I really wanted to be on stage because I like attention. So <laughs> I got on stage and every opportunity that I got to be on stage, I would be on stage because I was also told after college, I'll have to get married, have kids and stay at home because that's just how it is. You know, you, you go straight from adult, uh, from childhood to like housewifehood, you know, there's no adolescence in between. But I just wanted to be on stage and use every opportunity to get on stage. And I did dance, I did elocution. I also wanted to do music, but I couldn't sing. What do I do? But I've got rhythm in me and I can write songs. And back then, I'm saying 2004 time, you know, there was a new thing coming out into India, which was rhythm and poetry, rhythm and poetry, R-A-P, rap. So I was like, you know what, I can do this. And there's a very inspiring story of how I started rapping. I was in college, we were auditioning for the music uh, show, and I wanted to be in the music team, so I just went and stood next to the music team. I said, I'll figure what I want to do later. And there was this uh, female rapper, she was on stage and she was rapping, and she was horrible. Like that. There was no rhythm, there was no taal, there's no pitch. And I looked at her and said, I can do that better. So, you know, a lot of times good work inspires you, sometimes bad work inspires you. So then I started rapping. But then I said, I don't want to rap about something someone else writes because I'm a writer. I want to write for myself. And I can only write about what I know. And back then being a hijabi, this was just around 9-11. People were treading on eggshells around me wondering, can I ask her this question? Can I say this? 
will is she, like does she eat the same food as us does she like sing the same songs as us you know there was that so i said you know what i'm going to get on stage and i'm going to rap about my identity as a hijabi so uh, i'm going to do a little bit of that rap now just to give you a vibe of what it was but you will have to start off the chorus for me because i don't have my band so you'll have to sing twinkle twinkle little star okay you're all my musicians okay my backup vocalist ready so let's start twinkle Say in T W R N K L E, just cause I'm little, don't you play with me? I'm like stick dynamite. Once my fuse is alight, my explosions will keep you up all night. Got a couple of questions. What's with all the questions? First impressions aside, fresh in your mind is expression of belief. My convictions on my sleeve. This rendition of tradition, I just don't wanna leave. You look at me and Fred, how I wonder what you are. What you see is what you get, and this ain't over yet. And don't you dare forget, I'ma be a star. We'll each reach up above the big blue sky. Join along, little song. As I teach you all to fly, saying "Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are." And like that diamond on your finger, my brilliance has known it'll always linger. Thank you. As you can see, I used to be very humble back then. <laughs> But um, when I was on a stage like this, rapping this about my identity. i had a bunch of local uh, groups who came up to me and said you know we are advocates for social change we love that you have a voice would you like a platform and i said wow yeah because back then i was only rapping on college cultural stages that's when i met nityan and jayram and who i would say is my mentor and someone who has really shown me the way a lot of people here might already know niti he's an environmentalist he's a journalist he's just like an all round cool person so um niti came up to me and said we do something called justice rocks justice rocks is a rock show where musicians can come and perform you can perform your own songs but every justice rocks has a theme and the theme is some sort of edutainment we talk about some sort of environmental issue or any issue of corporate negligence we try to bring build social awareness sometimes it might be against government policy sometimes it could be even about moral policing and that year justice rocks was about the bhopal gas tragedy just to show up hands how many of you know about the bhopal gas tragedy i'm so happy to know that all of you have read about it or at least know something you know so i'm not going to go into the details i think you all know enough back then i'd learned about the bhopal gas tragedy in school but it's theory right but then when niti introduced me to the people from bhopal i spoke to victims you know because the after effects of the gas leak are still felt by even the third generation so speaking to the people just imagining the idea of that one day when that gas leaked and people are running across the street and just dropping dead around you suddenly i went oh my god this is something i want to rap about so niti said why don't you rap about this and i said okay i will write a song and back then what had happened was union carbide is the company responsible for the gas leak but union carbide was bought over by dow chemicals now we have a lot of lawyers in the house you all know when you buy over a company you also buy over its liabilities right but what dow chemicals was saying was oh you know we won't we we just bought uc we didn't buy its liabilities but they had com compensated asbestos workers in texas there was precedent of them having uh, paid heed to the liabilities that they owe but dow chemicals you know the history more than i do um was not doing right by the people and dow chemicals still operates in india they sell you your ever ready batteries they're selling you pesticides sometimes they sell you illegal pesticides and back then dow was going into colleges obviously and recruiting people because dow needs engineers a company like that cannot survive without engineers and india brain drain you know we were just sending them engineers after engineers and chennai being nerd central we have two things we have gamers and engineers or gaming engineers so um what we decided to do was go and talk to young people talk to engineering college students and say don't work for dow don't work for a dirty company like dow and that year the entire of iit boycotted the dow placements and a lot of engineers who were in the crowd who were from other universities like anna university or nsrm which are in chennai universities 
boycotted Dow placements. And this is huge because you know what placements are. If you've uh, seen Quota Factory or Alma Mater <laughs> or been an engineer, you know how it is. So I'm going to perform a bit of the song that we did that day. What we did was we did a rap battle. So I had a friend, he played Dow Chemicals and he rapped as Dow and I rapped as Bhopal and we were telling the audience, I was saying don't work for Dow and he was saying come work for Dow. So I'm just going to do a bit of just me saying don't work for Dow. Could you play? <clears throat> example of on ground when i say transmedia i don't mean only digital so this we went on ground spoke to people and that led to a movement where engineers started boycotting their placements um then justice rocks as it grew we started realizing okay we have this is 2004 i'm talking about so as we started growing we started working on more and more campaigns and then we realized you know what this is one kind of stage but well, there was another kind of stage that was coming up. And that stage, of course, was social media. And the next campaign that the, they were working on was about the mercury poisoning that happened in Kodaikanal. Now, this campaign they had been working on for quite a while. I will be getting into the details of what happened in, in Kodaikanal because it's all academics here. Generally, I just jump straight to the songs, but I thought I'll uh, add in a little bit more about the information of what happened around the campaign. So initially, now, before I jump into the campaign, I just wanted to also talk about why, um, why it's necessary to take to social media about such a serious issue. What is the most precious commodity today? The most precious commodity today is people's attention. It's so rare to see so many people pay attention to someone who's putting out a little way. You know, it's attention is so rare. And who all are vying for this commodity? If you could go to the next, I will go to the next slide. Who all are vying for this commodity? Bollywood. Bollywood is using social media to talk to because they're Tiger Shroff, Khan, Agla Movie Arai, Surya Vanshara, you know, they're trying to get people's attention and they're using YouTube, they're using Instagram, they're using WhatsApp to get your attention. Hollywood, multi crore, multi million dollar budgets trying to get your attention. Brands, again, I used to work in the advertising industry. They again have multi crore budgets and they're trying to get your attention saying, buy my product, buy my fairness cream, buy my nose hair fairness cream, whatever. And then, of course, there's politicians. I don't even need to get into this. We know how <laughs> data is being used by politicians. Meme pages. These people also want your attention. There's some person sitting in a basement making memes and they want you to want your attention. Content creators. All of you, I'm sure, must be following a number of content creators. There are a lot of Delhi content creators I love. I love Kusha Kapila. I love Dolly Singh. They want your attention too. And of course, your uncle and auntie sending you that WhatsApp message. They just join Instagram. So they're like, beta, follow my page. Now, all of these people want your attention on your Instagram timeline. All of them want your attention on your YouTube timeline. Now, we as advocates, when we try to build a campaign around a social issue, what do we think? It's a social issue, so people should pay attention to us. We don't realize we are on that same platform in between somewhere here. My message is also going. So if I have to fight these people, I need to think like them. I need to use music. I need to use video. I need to use 
every sort of medium that I have available with me to talk to these people. So that is what we did with Kodai Kanal Wound, where we made a music video. But what is the history of Kodai Kanal? What actually happened? Y'all, um, some people here will remember the 70s. Some people here know of it as <laughs> something that happened to our uh, The 70s was that whole hippie revolution was happening, you know. And like in 1963, Rachel Carson wrote Silent Springs. All of you, a lot of people have read it. It was the birth of the hippie movement. And also, you know, people were suddenly starting to realize the ill effects of industrial revolution. Okay, great. You know, science and technology are moving forward, but they're also polluting. So what was happening in USA was people were realizing if we need to cut pollution, we need to cut it at the source, which are the polluting factories. So there was a factory in Watertown, New York, but that was a thermometer factory that was uh, run by Chesborough Ponds. And back then, thermometers had mercury in it, live mercury. So they decided to shut down that factory because they realized the factory was indiscriminately dumping uh, mercury into the nearby rivers. But uh, US being uh, US, they outsourced their pollution. That factory came to India. That factory in 1983 was set up by Chespera Ponds in Kodai Canal. Kodai Canal is a beautiful hill station in the south. It's probably the only part in south where we ever feel winter. <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful hill station. And honestly, you know, like when you're setting up a factory, there's environmental assessments happening. You, you, need to, you need reasons for why a certain factory is being set up in a certain economic zone. The reason they set up the factory atop a hill is because it's cold, so they can save on AC costs. This is like typical middle-class uncle behavior. They're like, let's set this up here. And when they set it up, they called it a glass bottle manufacturing factory so that they could skip a few of these environmental assessment rules. It is so messed up. When they set up the factory and they called it a glass bottle manufacturing plant. And then you had these Tamil workers coming in who had to handle that mercury. And they've never seen this substance. In Tamil, it's called padarasam. It sounds like a beautiful word. Or There's a word called adirasam. There's a sweet called adirasam. It sounds like a sweet, you know, but like, so padarasam, the locals didn't know was toxic. Because you know what they would do? They had two workers who would just take the bottles aside and peel away the skull and crossbones logo. This logo would get peeled away from the bottles. So that because the workers can't read, but they know this is danger. So the this was happening. And then in between in 1986, Hindustan Unilever, uh, which was the Indian uh, subsidiary of Unilever and Anglo-Dutch company, took over the plant and continued this atrocity of telling people it's a glass bottle manufacturing company. They indiscriminately dumped mercury into the environment. And, you know, the scrap glass that, you know, like left, if there were broken thermometers, those were dumped into local dump yards. And because the workers didn't know what they were handling, they didn't realize it was a toxic substance. Mercury is something that affects the central nervous system. So what these people do, if they're in the furnace room, they can't hear each other, it's very loud. They'll pick up mercury and throw it at each other. Like, hey, sunna. They didn't realize they were putting poison on and into their bodies. In fact, mercury is a very pretty substance. Silver, right? I don't know. In school, if you've seen it, it spins around. So they would take it home to give to the kids to play with. Thousands of workers were poisoned. The attrition rate in this, uh, in, in this uh, factory was very high because people would just get headaches, gum bleeding, this, that. And they just thought they were just unhealthy and would leave. And then next more. So thousands of workers went through this factory. And even it started affecting children born of these workers because there were female workers, there were male workers and all of that. So after all this, finally in 2001, there was an activist who went to a scrapyard and he saw scrap thermometer with some shiny silver substance. He figured, okay, this is mercury. He's like, where is this coming from? Figured it comes from the factory. Realized they've been indiscriminately dumping into the local ecosystem. Kodai Canal, the Pambar Shola Reserve, which is close to the factory, is a very sensitive e ecosystem. It has at least about 17 species of endangered flora and fauna. And it's a bit of a watershed. So there is water that, that is uh, stepping down and that mercury is getting washed away into the soil, into the Kodai Lake, into the local ecosystem. So immediately they got people together and they shut down the factory. 
first thing good they managed to shut down the factory now when they shut down the factory i want to tell one thing they did the, they did dharnas they walked from the kode lake to the factory grounds insisting that they shut it down leading it with the tribals always always when we are working with grassroots movements or environmental issues it's always the tribals who step up first because they know the value of natural resources for you and i we open a tap that's water for them water is the river from which they bathe and when they drink and when they sleep and when some of you might also have experience with this because coming from all parts of india so the tribals led the march they were environmentalists they were uh, journalists again it's trans media in a sense because there were people from different walks of life doing this walk and they shut down the factory and then they sent uh, around 280 tons of mercury laden soil to the us like to here a cloak types <laughs> but mainly because we didn't have plants in india that could uh, uh, treat mercury contaminated soil so all this happened and then journalists started writing about it now the main demand was compensate workers and clean up the environment 280 tons of mercury laden soil was sent back but there's still mercury in the it's in there in the lake you can't dredge the lake but it's there in the spambar shola and it was still continuing to leach from the factory site so neither the factory site cleaned up so journalists worked on news articles scientists came in and they did reports that we had tv anchors who did special news stories we had documentary filmmakers who made documentaries and we had us who went on to transmedia and we started using social media one of the first campaigns that we did uh, when i say we i mean nitty sir he is the mastermind behind all this uh, is what we call crowd speaking we used an app called uh, thunder clap sorry this thing is blocking it it doesn't exist anymore uh, back then thunder clap was an app which allowed number of people to tweet the same thing at the same time now i'll give you a little tip about uh, social media just think uh, all of you watch a video but you watch it at different different times you watch it today you watch it tomorrow you watch it day after you still get 100 views the chances of that video gaining momentum and going viral is less but if all 100 of you watch it at the same time twitter instagram and youtube will think oh something is trending and momentum builds momentum you know how you say money makes more money momentum builds momentum on social media if, if twitter thinks oh a lot of people are talking about this they will also push it so they used the thunder clap to uh, do a campaign called have a heart mr poman where they got a lot of influencers a uh, lot of influential people back then there were no influencers to talk about this issue then we had kodaikanal won i will uh, play this video for those of actually have any of you not seen kodai kanal won't if everyone seen it then i'm going to skip it <laughs> oh some of you have not seen okay then uh, i will play kodai kanal won't for you all to get an idea of whatever i've said in music Okay, we seem to have a bit of a technical glitch. Up uh, next, <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll I'll do a bit of the song. Um, this was uh, there was a song by Nicki Minaj called Anaconda that had come out, and for me, when I heard the song, it was a little bit of skinny shaming in a sense for me. And then I was like, you know what? It's it's a great track. It's by Sir Mix a Lot. Why? why should be used for skinny shaming let's use it for corporate scheme for co- corporate shaming so uh we did uh, uh i did a version i hope i remember this it's been a while ago so it goes code <clears throat> carnal won't code carnal won't code carnal won't step down until you make amends now this is the story of code's frustration known to us as the princess of hill stations unilever came and left devastation as they exposed the land to contamination but here's the story prolonged mercury sorry i'm so sorry i've forgotten the song I'm, i will send you all the link 
But anyway, the idea was that we used a popular song, we spoofed it. Thank you. <laughs> and the video got 4 million views. Uh, sorry. Check, 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 check. Yeah. So the video got about 4 million views. But here's the thing. 4 million views does not mean 4 million people better informed. This video got the message out, which then got the attention of the company in the UK. Because they realized, oh no, they're mentioning our brands. Because in the video, we had mentioned the names of Hindustan Unilever's brands, like Pe Pepsodent and Fair and Lovely. Because we were like, there's nothing fair and lovely about this trial. So when that started happening, news media came in. And it, as much as you can use social media when you have traditional media along with it, it just adds so much more momentum to what you're talking about. Then local politicians started talking about it. There was a lot of momentum that happened. But does that mean all 4 million people who watched the video understood what the issue was? Maybe not. Maybe some people just went, have a fun song. Nice. <laughs> Maybe some people just went, oh, I, I want a virtue signal. This seems like an issue I also want to share. So I look like I'm, an, I'm a woke person. But in those 4 million, maybe 2 million will click on the petition that was linked to the video. And they did. They signed the petition. Out of the 2 million, maybe 1 million decided, I want to read more about this. Maybe they did. And out of that, maybe there were 50,000 uh, uh, people who went, you know what? I want to know more. Unilever is saying this. What, what is the counterpoint? We can't just believe everything that some ra female rapper said just because it rhymes. So... For that, we released another video, which I'm not playing now, which was a point counterpoint video. So that was a little more in depth, you know, just like how you're all academic. So I'm getting into the history and the details. This was for people who wanted details. So documentary, all of these are necessary. The song alone could not exist in isolation. Everything that each one of you do, we needed lawmakers. We, need, we had lawyers who were working with the workers association because the moment Unilever came and said, okay, what can we do? We said, hey, we have a lawyer, speak to a lawyer. So different kind of people with different expertise came in and contributed to 591 employees being compensated by the company. And that was the power of using social media the right way. Thank you. So this is what I mean by collaboration. When you're working as an NGO or as possibly as a law firm, or if you have a campaign that you're building, collaborating with experts really help. Yes, you might be able to sing, but working with a musician who has spent their entire life writing music would help. Work with the experts. And even when you're collaborating, make the collaboration easier. For example, just think you have a... Uh, a message that you want to get out there and you want to work with influencers. You want to reach out to politicians. You want to reach out to social media influencers, stand-up comics, Veerdas, whoever. You want them to retweet your link. Make it easy for them. Don't just send them the link and say, now please write something about this. Veerdas must be getting 50,000 people like you emailing him every day saying, please, please give my cause some... Uh, like yeah, share my cause, share my cause. What if you sent Virdas the written message of what he could share? Give him five options and say you could write this or you could write something on your own. Don't stifle his creativity. Then what will Virdas do? He's opened his email. He just has to copy paste this, right? His life is easy like Chalo well done. Versus if I open an email, someone has sent me, please share my video. Then I'll be like, huh, I need to think about this. No, not right now. Right now I'm doing a workshop. I'll do it after the workshop. I'll never do it. How many times have you all taken notes at seminars like this? And any of you have opened those notes ever? No. I'll give links. Any of you open those links? No. So make it easy for your collaborators. Then there are some other learnings. Ride on trends. We used Anaconda uh, because it was a trend. But when I say ride on trends, I don't mean only do cover songs. What I mean is even the title of your videos matter. In the title of your video, if currently... If, uh, say, there is, uh, just think, uh, some challenge, the, the blue shoe challenge is trending. In your title, you say, this is more interesting than the blue shoe challenge. Clickbait is tacky. 
you don't want to do it but remember who you're going against bollywood hollywood ad are all doing this so why shouldn't you you need to play the game the way they play it then time of release this is again very important could we move uh, this window could could we just move that window it's blocking the ppt so time of release if you ask me why did kodekanal won't go viral i don't have an answer but i do know some things that work for it when kodekanal won't release there wasn't there wasn't really a big news story so news people new journalists were vela they wanted something to write about <laughs> you know if you think okay i'm going to release my video at 5 pm today and then the really big news piece breaks out wait push your story a little bit that matters momentum builds momentum i've already told you uh, get everyone to talk about it at the same time build enough intrigue for that time and get all your friends to share it at the same time the time uh, and the momentum matters and also don't think that i will put it on my page it's a good piece it will get enough views today's youtube algorithm is so warped they are not pushing organic content they are only pushing content that is brands that is uh, boosted posts so maybe go to a channel that already has 2 million subscribers go to a scoop up go to a buzzfeed go to a netflix india and these are channels you'd think they have a lot of money they don't so when you give to give them a video that you've already made they're like i i don't have to spend any money give me the video i'll put it up don't think that i should be done in my name to go on sofia ashraf's channel the cause should always come first so if you have the choice of putting it on a channel that already has subscribers the chances of more people seeing it is larger and then content follows context this is like saying form follows function which they teach you in design school think of where you're putting the piece now kodaikanal won't kodaikanal is an issue that happened in tamil nadu song should have been in tamil but where did i put it i put it on youtube what was my maksad what was my uh, motive i wanted paul poman in uk to see it so it was in english but when i went to local on ground marches we had tamil songs we had parai artists we had folk musicians so context is everything understand where you're putting the video understand why you're putting it and cater to that audience do not try to please all of the people and that brings me to the most important point in all this which is their uh, i'll ca- i'm going to skip a little bit there is wait i think it got skipped there is no one single cure uh there there was one song in our time michael jackson healed the world was the world healed because what did he try to do he wanted to sing about everything you can take a song and say poverty is uh, famine flood uh, marital rape uh, illiteracy you can just name all these things is the order audience better informed no but if you have a choice to work on a more focused project choose that and just think for example i we put out a video called period part that was in english and it was about sustainable menstruation a very privileged statement because there are villages in india that does not even get access to sanitary pads or tampons and here i'm saying tampons and sanitary pads have bleach in them but it's okay i was talking to an audience who was putting bleach into their body that message needed to go out so don't feel bad that i'm talking about such a pointed issue because then otherwise you're going into what about tree or oh, what about this or maybe there's a bigger problem let me talk about that but i'm talking about this what about that what about that if you get into what about tree there will be always someone who is worse off and someone who is worse off you'll never end up making any content then there is um little little things also matter your thumbnail matters put a little effort into your thumbnail on youtube make sure your thumbnail is it's a nice looking picture because a lot of times when i'm on youtube i choose the thumbnail i look at the thumbnail and i pick it instagram you all know you have to put a vertical thumbnail but the center part only gets cropped do so what you should do is when you make a thumbnail whatsapp it to yourself or signal it to yourself or whatever so you can see it in a small size and see is it clear figure out where it, if you whatsapp a vertical thumbnail to yourself the center will get cropped automatically so you can see acha this is how it look on instagram or archive your uh, instagram uh, post and then check it see if uh, the thumbnails matter or 
and in instagram text matters because a lot of people watch it silently on mute very i'm sure there'll be some of you when secretly checking instagram right now so people are watching it on mute so put text put text on your instagram videos transmedia does not mean the same video goes everywhere separate for youtube instagram keep it within a minute time matters uh, anything more than a minute people get bored on instagram then call to action please have a clear call to action and make the call to action easy to access don't put it uh, put a link in the video you can't click on a link if it's written in a video www./231unilever.com/home/archive i have to go type it over no add it in your description if you've got instagram use link tree you uh, add link in bio and make sure the link directs directly to the petition if there are people who want to read more let them have other links don't make people do two three steps because first link second link third link by fourth link i've given up i you've already given them the information trust your content you've given them the information directly let them go to the petition so then this i think is the most important lesson that i have learned when creating content or trying to reach out to an audience never stop being an audience yourself laugh at silly jokes watch bollywood movies listen to crappy songs it doesn't matter if you enjoy something enjoy it if you think lamborghini is a great track i love lamborghini listen to it never stop being an audience because the moment you stop being an audience you lose that connection with the audience there are those of us who are saying no instagram you know doom scrolling happens instagram isn't good no tiktok tiktok those gone anyway but like taka tak no i club whatever clubhouse i don't want to be on it you think but you'll be surprised there are so much of good content out there don't follow the trash follow the good stuff only there i know so many musicians will come and say i want to create a video but i don't have twitter or youtube or instagram how do i where do i put it i'm like this is like saying i'll come to your house you give me chai i'll say i don't want chai but if you come to my house and don't drink my chai i take in offense if you don't follow other people how can you expect others to follow you I know a lot of people think social media is a lot of time wasting but follow the right people follow journalists I'm sure everyone here follows fake you know I'm not going to tell you who to follow but I'm just saying you know there there is good content out there do not dismiss even or like even TikTok back in its time had news pieces they started like TEDx type of stuff so don't discount the very platforms that you're going to use for your messaging so that was the overall um basic things that i some of the learnings that i had that i wanted to share with you all uh it kind of brings me to the end of my discussion because i've taken quite a lot of time uh i would like to end with just one more song this was a song i had uh, written uh, for delhi a while ago it's about air pollution uh but we'll make it into a little game okay initially when i wrote the song it was a breathless rap i rapped it in one go which i can't do anymore and you know right the air we breathe affects our lung capacity so there will be a timer that will start it will start over here it will come somewhere over here when the timer starts put up your hand and hold your breath the moment you run out of breath put your hand down we'll do a test go oh you can put your hand down so when you run out of breath put your hand down let's see how many of you last how long i'm not going to do it breathless i uh, <laughs> i'm not the same person i was when i was your age <laughs> let me just give you a moment so this will be the last song that i'm doing for the day <sighs> all right ready ready to hold your breath play it Exposure to 
uh, pollution can affect your lung capacity also so this was a little exercise we used to do where we used to get rappers to wrap it all in one breath and see how much uh, how long they can hold their breath and i think everyone knows what's happening in delhi so maybe there are little ways in which we can bring awareness on all this uh, that brings me to the end of my talk uh, we have some time for questions yes we do have some time for questions if any of you have any questions it's okay we're all friends here it can be personal it can be about the work also i'm free to take any questions in any language Uh, hi sukya uh, this is farheen uh, you did mention about your work uh, uh, in menstruation field would you uh, like to share a bit more about that yes so uh, we did a song called uh, period patter this was more of a personal thing where i moved on to the menstrual cup the menstrual cup is a more sustainable menstrual product which because it's reusable unlike a sanitary pad because a sanitary pad not only does it have bleaching agents which are harmful for your body uh when you dispose of sanitary pads now think of a hospital when they dispose of blood soaked bandages they have separate bio waste bins and those are sent to separate sorting uh, sorting facilities but when you dispose of uh, blood soaked sanitary pads it goes into your trash which goes into landfills and there are workers who are pulling your part, taking your part, pad apart by hand so i didn't want to put someone in that position so i moved on to menstrual cup and cloth pads so we did a song called period patter where we used a folk music storytelling form called villa patter which is a south indian storytelling form back you know they think protest music and all is something the new age rappers we invented folk artists have been using music to talk about causes for generations and especially villa patter and all was a way to talk to people about these things so we just contemporized that i would i would think i would gladly send you a link of period patter for you to take a look at that I uh, I want to. I'm interested in knowing. Do you face any problems, any backlash? Legal, <laughs> whatever. Um. So I'll tell you a couple of ways in which I could have faced legal issues. And if you tried something like a correct and I'll want today, what are the legal issues you could face? Um. <clears throat> First of all, I used someone else's track IP. I it could get flagged. But back then, the video had gained so much momentum. It would have looked bad on the artist part if she had asked me to take it down. uh but if i were a channel that was monetized she could have they could have done it legally they could have asked me to take it down because monetized channel if you see meme pages get away with anything they use kisi ka bhi image kisi ka bhi music but pages that are monetized that get ad revenue they are not allowed to use outside music so that we escaped secondly when it came to again uh it could have been like unilever could have sued me uh but i think the movement had gathered so much momentum by then they would have looked like the bad guys or the bad girls or the bad others if they had done that so uh, i think they refrained from that i got lucky that way um but it's interesting the backlash i think everyone knows trolls is the biggest backlash that we face i've gone against corporations i've gone against governments i've gone against my own chief minister outside her house but the greatest backlash i have ever faced was there was a sexist rapper in 2012 who put out a song called clubbala mabala and i did a diss track as a response to that because it was extremely misogynistic and extremely close minded and that diss track got death threats got threats against like i don't even want to get into the kind of language that the audience went into i was so funny like i'm going up against corporations and i haven't got threats the way going up against patriarchy has got to be so it's just interesting to understand your audience hi uh shall i uh, yeah uh i wish was that you have mentioned that you have been working with the communities about the making folk songs so how did you manage to go with them and how did you gain the trust and you are working with them and for them so if you could elaborate over it very very important question i think uh, so this is i think that, that it was about choosing your battles for example when uh, we go to uh, uh 
say a village in Tamil Nadu where we were building a school. I'm someone who, um, like, I have tattoos. I I wear sleeveless. Uh, I drink occasionally. These are things habits that I have. But when I went to that village, I dressed fully. I didn't. I never touched alcohol. I was clean the whole time. Because for me, it wasn't about going there and saying, "Why can't women wear sleeveless?" I could have. I I wasn't there for that. I was there. There we were trying to break caste barriers. We were trying to break so many barriers. So for parents to send their children to our school, we needed to gain their trust. So I think it's about choosing your battles in the context. Second uh, uh, part of that, when another thing, working with lo- musicians, I have made so many mistakes in that. Uh, there was a follow-up song to Kodaikanal Won't. Where we worked with Pare musicians. Pare is a uh, uh, South India's uh, music. It's a drum. Uh, it's it's really great. It's a folk music form. It's primarily done by uh, the Dalit uh, community. Uh, and uh, when we were working with the Pare artists, uh, what we would do is we the the those of us who were composing, like who, the vocalist and I, went into the studio, composed the song. And then called the pare artist and said, "Okay, eighteen bars, play." I said, "Wow, Anna, super Anna, all of that." I got schooled so hard by Nithi after that. I said, "He said this is tokenism. You should compose with them because this is their music you are borrowing. How can you treat them as others? Just giving them sixteen bars and saying now you do. That's not how you work. You need to work with them. And I've, I think, working with local musicians, I've learned so much. I've just come from." in marshal pradesh where we had 30 musicians across india who were singing in different languages i think when it comes to music like real music music has no language uh, so it's easy to bring us together but once we are together to still understand yes music has no language but to speak to them translate everything you say compose with them instead of just giving them 16 bars to perform i think i've learned it <laughs> the hard way thank you for your question mm-hmm. shiv a little bit you, you already answered but i still wanted to ask you that if you were to identify yourself would you first call yourself a musician or an activist that's the first question and one other kind of follow up question is that you know you you said that you you were a hijabi out of choice and then the transition and you know the entire the you know, challenges between identity choice feminism and the whole bunch of it i just want to know a little more about this journey of yours of how you trans yeah there is a lot to unpack <laughs> how much time do i have <laughs> okay um so i'll tell you what had happened uh, i grew up in an orthodox muslim household but um it was a house where the choice was ours in fact uh, i started wearing the abaya which was that black all black whereas my mother would just wear the hijab i started wearing the abaya out of choice because this was a time when islamophobia was rife and we felt like our identity and our community was under attack and when your identity and community is under attack you hold on to it harder so we suddenly we had like all of us started putting on the abaya we started going back to original islamic texts and i used to run this group called muslim youth culture it was very cool what we do is we'll meet once in a month i'll pick a topic and all of us do our own research uh, in the quran and the hadith the hadith is the life of the prophet so we did our own research we would come and it was a forum there was no molana it was only young women we just talked to each other about whatever we read and have discussions <clears throat> what made me give up religion uh, it's a very interesting okay as academics you'll understand this when you are studying religion religious studies you study it with the sense of spirituality there is a holiness to it and there is less questioning but at the same time i was studying philosophy at school and you know what they say religion has all the answers but no questions philosophy has all questions but no answers so i was studying alternative uh, i was studying philosophy in college and uh, one of the lessons were about world religions now on one side i'm researching islam <laughs> on the other side i was researching world religions as in it it was christianity hinduism islam judaism buddhism it was just a list of all this in a very academic sense and suddenly i started looking at my own uh, research with less of a spiritual lens and more of an academic lens because what was in before me and i realized that a few of those values i didn't align with 
so when i felt that i didn't align with these values i said you know what i want to move away from this so i gave up my religion and i there was a lot of backlash from family and you know that's what people think right going against society is like hartal and like pocket fences and tear gas but my tearman square was standing in front of my grandmother while she's crying and saying mole just wear the hijab one more time and i'm saying no this is not what i want to do i need to stick with what i want my hemlock was willfully accepting the fact that my mother would never be okay with the person i am and that was poisoning me from within i think when you move away from religion there is that phase of initial 5 to 6 to 7 years where everyone around you thinks it's a phase and then they don't even take you seriously and to really feel no 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 this is what i want to do and then after 10 years they see you that you're doing well um they they start accepting okay this is who she is but i think the biggest thing that has helped me was commercial success i think financial success you know initially if you are a uh, uh, playing music they're like oh this is haram in my house music is not was not allowed oh this is haram what you're doing is bad this that but 10 years later after you've gone viral they want to take selfies with you <laughs> so i think the only way you can change it is to get famous <laughs> yes um so we will i think you uh, you yes can i uh, i think someone will have to moderate who answers the question i'm feeling bad choosing uh-huh. Ma'am, just a very small huh. question. You uh, mentioned about the female health hierarchy. Uh, people over here are much literate to understand the depth of the problem what females face. But if we talk about like uh, I'm not mentioning, but if we talk about our our parents, like in my house, uh, I cannot talk to my father about the uh, pro- like menstrual cycle and all. So uh, how to deal with it? Like if I want to uh, bring some change, like. Uh, Uh, ask the females to shift from the sanitary pads to the menstrual cup then how can we do it because the thing is uh, these people will understand but if you go to the rural uh, area the their people i cannot step forward and talk to them we have to choose some female volunteers but i want to change that i will be able to uh, like to communicate with them so how can i bring that so yeah that was this on um, solution i was going to say i think understand the context where we are i think um, you know there is male gaze there is privilege gaze there is all of that so when you go to say somewhere where they're not when like i used to be someone who never used to talk to boys so if a man were to come and talk to me about menstrual pro- pro- products i would seriously be scandalized so it's already a taboo so i would say take it one step at a time the way in the village i said okay let me wear full sleeves and then talk to them so going uh, it's about building allies and i think you have so many allies here use the allies that you have and maybe sending them videos really help but yes uh, i know it's great that you want to break it and you want to talk to uh, them yourself but understand it's it's all, it's generational trauma you're breaking uh but there are people who have broken it i can give you very positive examples in my office we have uh, fop first day of period is a paid leave now when uh, when the office instated the, when they uh, declared for this would be a paid leave all the men started coming and genuinely asking us why do you need an off and then we had to tell them there is endometriosis there are some women who face it harder there are some for some women it's like la 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 whatever it's like those ads but for some women it's debilitating pain it is back ache it is heavy bleeding and they really it's 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 genuinely they need that day off so this guy went oh all women go through this way. like yeah all women like my maid also goes through this they're like yeah he went back and told his maid first day of period aap le lo chutti mm. that blew my mind we didn't think of it as women none of us thought of it so that was i think there were two more questions yeah uh, for, they've been asking for a while as you have mentioned that you have received a lot of backlash for your work and you have struggled a lot and your family as well so these things do affect your mental health so how do you manage to overcome such negativity in your life and number 2 i wanted to know whom do you idolize in your life thank you first thing i would say <clears throat> i am blessed with positive mental health just because someone is strong do not assume you need to be as strong as them i 
uh, and positive mental health is a daily practice there are days when i have down days but i have been blessed with i am not prone to anxiety whereas the, i know women with the same capabilities as me who are prone to mental health panic attacks anxiety disorders so first of all i would say don't listen to my advice because my health it is like uh, if you are going to someone who like you are someone who needs weekly dialysis and someone who does not need weekly dialysis and you're comparing yourself with them and saying how i how is your kidney so strong mental health is also a form of health the word health is there in it but there are some practices i do keep first of all they tell artists ignore the comments they say ignore the trolls this is easier said than done as an artist what is your job your for an empath you feel not just as an artist all of you must be motivated by certain things that's why you are you have chosen law you have chosen business you're motivated by certain things and you need you felt for causes and when you tell you to cut off that feeling how can you create art anymore so i won't say ignore feel but build a support system i didn't do it when i was younger i didn't build a support system because i was i was fighting my family so much that i stopped myself from allowing myself to build relationships and i'll tell you why when i uh, started doing my own thing one time i went back home my grandmother was in the hospital and my father pointed to my grandmother and said she is in the hospital because of you because you are out there singing songs she is in this state now that could have broken me because this is someone i love i sleep next to my grandmother at night that's the kind of relationship we had so i the only way i could deal with that was cutting off love from my life saying i will never love anyone anymore because if i don't love i won't feel pain but please that i feel now that's the wrong way to do it build support systems build friendships i am now making an effort to build people like me who are of the similar community and uh, you know how like abroad they have alcoholics anonymous groups and things like that i think in india we need social bull- social media bullying and harassment support groups i think it would be beautiful if even colleges started this um that's to answer the first question i think uh, one it's also a daily exercise like sometimes when i say mental health even bo- positive body image is something which is not a confidence is not a birthright i have made a song called i can't do sexy which is a song talking about i'm happy with who i am i don't care what what you call me i love my body but then there are some days when i wake up and i'm like i have a pimple i hate how i look and then i have to watch my own song and say hey <laughs> <laughs> so i think positive health is a daily exercise so i hope that answered and the second question you said what was the second who do i idolize there are so many people oh my god where do i start um where growing up there used to be this rapper called missy elliot she was not just a rapper she was a producer and one of the things she did was she built other rappers and other produce women around her she introduced cr she introduced so many female rappers out there so i liked that idea that it wasn't just her making rap but also pushing other women then the biggest biggest uh, impact in my music was mia MIA is a Sri Lankan refugee who moved to the UK and started making music. You might have heard her in I think what was the movie Slumdog Millionaire all I want to do is bang bang bang. What I learned from her was when I was young now we all of us we used to listen to Eminem and Tupac and all. So we used to rap with an American accent. I used to say can't. I don't say can't I say can't. But in my rap it would be can't and shan't. That would be my rhyme scheme. and i listened to mia and she had kutto beats in her music she had local folk flavor and i said wait a minute i have an accent that only i have i have a flavor that only i have why am i trying to have someone else's accent then i started saying can't in my rap i started rapping with an indian accent because i think we are so ashamed of the indian accent no it is ridiculous how much accent insecurity we have so i think mia just inspired me to like embrace my accent one else there um uh, ma'am as uh good evening ma'am my name is anisha kumari uh ma'am as your protest rapper and your voice is basically against the unethical aspects of uh, either corporates or environment and so on uh then there might have been lots of challenges in your way 
so how you handle the challenges coming to your way and and what psychology that helped you in this path uh i think i'll have to check my privilege i come from a bit of privilege i'm <clears throat> cushioned by uh, having access to media people uh come from a family that in case i get sued i can afford lawyer fees so i think i'll have to check my privilege in that way um then with psychologically i think as i mentioned with her um i was able to ignore trolls a lot like if someone's just saying like bad words at me it's easy to ignore them but uh i think the toughest part of my journey was at times when i made mistakes i have made cast blind videos and now when i see those videos i just want to dig a hole and disappear forever when i made videos like that and i got called out i just wanted to stop making music altogether because i said i don't deserve to have a voice after making the mistake that i did but what helped me then was i had a support system around me who realized i am not beyond rehabilitation i made a mistake i was stupid i did something really bad i put out a video that was casteist but it was because i was blinded when i was young so the support system around me sat me down and explained saying hey here is where you went wrong here are some books you can read so they what they did is they didn't call out they called in where is the rest of the internet because you can ignore people who you think are your enemies but you can't ignore hate from comrades from people who are in the development sector and when they tell you you made a mistake suddenly you're like oh my god i'm such a horrible human being that's when it hits you in those times accepting you are wrong it helps to shut off for a bit shut off from the internet it helps and also having a support system who can teach you the right way it's it's a process i think uh, there are systems abroad that are slowly coming up for rehabilitating people who have been cancelled cancel culture is something that the internet has because it's a you're either with us or with a, uh, against us uh, idea right like just think there's someone who's been called out in the me too moment the moment that person's called out nobody wants to associate with them but then wait a minute this person is not beyond change they made mistakes but none of us want to put in the effort to talk to them and say hey here is why what, what he did was maybe not appropriate here are ways in which you can change and we I, you know when the me too moment happened i was just calling up people and saying hey i don't believe you're the worst human being in the world let us figure out ways to change because a lot of my friends were also called out because i'm from the stand up comedy industry i think the as a society we tend to cancel too easily because it's the easy thing to do now boycott if someone makes a mistake it's easier to say i cancel this person i will no longer subscribe to their views than to say this person made a mistake let me take the time and the energy to help them understand why they made a mistake and so i think let's try to use that is what i would say so uh, ma'am uh, what kept you inspiring and how can we just be a part of such moment along with our professions ma'am i i have a full time profession i earn a very nice living <laughs> i'm a filmmaker uh, i i earn a comfortable living and i uh, do this on the side whenever i get time uh, i think one of the ways again like i said collaborating a lot of times what we tend to do is whenever we want to do social causes no we we put our name first we were like oh i as sophia i should want to start something you would be surprised of the number of movements that already exist in india who could use people like you who need people who can do research who need academics who you saw the kodaikanal movement how many people were involved we had it people uh, there was a campaign we did for bopal where we needed uh, 1 lakh signatures because we wanted to raise a petition to the white house you know what we did they had uh, people who knew it really well they found a really genius hack they went to bopal with laptops and they figured a way where you like oh you're a lo local you don't have computer you know you're a local i'll make you an email id right now sign petition you i'll make you an email id right now sign petition we need people of all things so i think 
collaborating with an already existing ngo is far far better than trying to build something from scratch and then like you know because for example uh, i think this is an example i keep building bringing up there was an all india women's march that had happened a couple of years ago this was basically um, in bangalore on new years there was a mass uh, groping case that had happened and the state's official response to that was victim blaming so the w- women we got really angry we were like how can you how can the state's official response be victim blaming we have a rights to these streets so we were took to the streets we had an all india women's march but then each group said no i want to do it in my name i wanted it to be in my organization i will do a separate march you do this march imagine if all the women all across india are taken to the streets so sometimes it's better to join a bigger crowd than to try to start something new and the, there's so much to learn from earlier activists there are so many inspiring people sitting here there's so much they will have to teach us also and so much of course that if i know a lot of them have that yearning to learn i know working with niti he wants to know what is social media he wants to understand things like that so i think it's a give and take so try to collaborate is what i would say is that the last question okay we yes, have ma'am. to wind up uh firstly good evening ma'am uh, it's my pleasure to ask question to you uh basically ma'am my question was as ma'am told you have started your journey in very young time like at that moment a uh, people sometime wouldn't be uh, that they didn't have that much courage courage like they started their journey in this manner so i would like to ask like how would you uh, how did you tackle such situation when you totally lose your hope like now i'm um, now i'm uh, like the uh, now i'm end up with such a shit so like what people think to you and uh, they m- might have had uh, like you might have had such a situation when you think about like what they are what they are doing what they are doing with me or what say saying to me at that moment how do you tackle uh, with such a situation like it would be a uh, inspirational to us as a student <laughs> so we will have a great inspiration from you to mera to opposite hua hai life mein <laughs> when i was younger na i didn't know and better so i was very brave i didn't know what legal rec- repercussions were <laughs> and it, so i was very brave now i have more to lose because i have property i have a job i have a name so actually it's scary when you're older but i think another thing when you it's also how we bring up our children we tell them they don't know any better they don't know any better uh again my context is very different i came from privilege i could do this the way i did it was i moved out of home but at 22 when i was 22 i moved out of home to bangalore to bombay i did that because while i was around family they were like oh, going out living on your own oh it's scary it's scary but i went and lived on my own i'm like oh, it's not that scary there is the kind of generational trauma that does come in for example in my in muslim households you're not allowed to touch your dog so it is it was so rampant in my house that every time they saw dogs they would scream and run now as a child i'm seeing my mother my caregiver and my father the bravest man i know running away from a dog so i think dogs are scary so i grew up believing dogs are scary and i got had phobia of dogs i moved out of home i love dogs now so sometimes it helps to take yourself away from that context but again everyone's reality is not the same i grew up my parents were spe- uh, uh they never raised their hands on me i never faced physical violence so it was easier for me to be brave there are some people who face the threat of physical violence so for them i would say <laughs> no mine is not the advice you need to like there, I, this comes with a caveat that i came from privilege and my parents at least did not beat me and i didn't have that threat of violence i could move away from home separate myself from that context and realize that a lot of these fears are just from our parents because they haven't they grew up in a different time and then when you surround yourself with other people college you realize hey this is normal women do this you can get on a stage and perform and it's not wrong so it's just normalizing these things thank you sophia
um, can I now, uh, we could go on asking her questions and we can do that over tea, which will be there at five o'clock. Do join us. Uh, Mr. Katoj, uh, BCF's treasurer and one of our foundation stones from day one is here with us. Would you please give the vote of thanks? A very good evening to everyone. Uh, as Amitra just mentioned, my name is Katoj and I'm a founding member of BCF. And it's my pr proud privilege to propose a vote of thanks to a wonderful speaker. And on behalf of BCF, I would like to thank Sophia Ashraf for a very inspirational address and for agreeing to be here with us this afternoon so willingly at such short notice. Unknown to you, your videos have been used by BCF for our training programs for courses across the country. We would also like to thank our partners, Development Alternatives, led by Dr. Ashok Kosla and team for agreeing to host this in their campus, again at short notice, given all the challenges. Special thanks to the IT team, communication team, Justine Kaur, and Dave Alternatives teams. They have helped PCF put together this program this afternoon. Well, I hope this was useful and informative address to all of us to think in terms of strat strategy to help the communities around us in this hour of need. At the center of BCF sits our concern, engagement with our communities who are our prime stakeholders. While development alternatives is embarking on its golden jubilee decade, as we just heard, we at BCF are much younger, going on to our silver jubilee next year. Of course, we have much to share, learn from each other as partners and friends. Uh, some of our board members and, of course, our chairperson uh, was here and I extend my gratitude to them and to Professor Ravi Sharma and Mr. Asim, ISDM, and all participants who have braved the Delhi Air to be here with us this afternoon. I hope our young students from Asia Business and Law School, ISDM, can think of creative, out-of-the-box solutions to some complex issues that need innovative and low cost approaches. Of course, social media can play a positive role in our endeavor, as we just heard. I wish you all success in our, in your, sorry, in your endeavors and a pollution free future uh, being here in Delhi. Uh, a very big thank you to our speaker who really kept us on our toes all afternoon and I wish you all the very best. Uh, as a small token of appreciation from BCF, we'd like to you to accept this please. Uh, this is from the lovely DA stall here and their wonderful products. So all of you please go and have a look at it post uh, the lecture. Can I ask Professor Archana Kumar who's here with us, who's also on the BCF board, uh, to show our appreciation in a Buddhist fashion. <laughs> and I want to acknowledge a lot of friends here and thanks also to Zenith and Ashok Kosla and everybody who helped us put this together. And a lot of friends who are here, um, you know, Kanika, who's, you know, whose songs helped a whole organization called Shruti. Uh, we have Osama from Development, uh, yeah, DEF, Empowerment Foundation, we have Farheen here who will be taking us to Old Delhi. We are going for a walk after this to Chandni Chowk. We have Indu. We have Ashok Pandey. Um, we have uh, Upender, Matthew's classmate and friend. We have Ashima. We had the team from Helpage. Uh, and all our students, it's so wonderful to see you. You know, I missed seeing you in the last one and a half years. 
and Asia Business School and Law School. You've been our partners, ISDM, all of you. So just wonderful to see you all here. <laughs> and Lady Irwin College, I'm so sorry. Some of the students are here. Deepa, you're here as well. Uh, Jayashree, everybody. Uh, Tanuja, Laura, you introduce yourself. If I've missed out anybody, please uh, you know, put up your hand. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. And I hope you found it useful and informative. We are thrilled to have Sophie here with us. She's been my icon. <laughs> And some of our inspiration, and Archana will tell you over tea how we've used your videos, both in the PG courses that we do with you and other places. Mr. Katoj, thank you again. Mr. Katoj heads the Bhumi Vardhan Foundation. He was with Cadbury for many years, a man of many years of experience who spares his valuable time for our foundation. So thank you all. DA, big round of applause for DA as well. Thank you, Zina. Thank you, Ashok. Bye bye. Please join us for tea. Students, you must be hungry. <laughs> and catch Sophia over some questions over tea as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you.